Welcome to And Performance. This is a, a new interview series made by Mount View exploring the MA Performance Programme. Uh, my name is Dr Joe Parslow and I'm an MA tutor at Mount View. Um, I work primarily on the MA Performance Acting and Musical Theatre strands and I'm also a researcher with a focus on queer performance and queer communities as well as a producer of drag performance events and nightlife in London. Um, in these conversations we're going to talk to graduates of the MA Performance Programme and I'm going to ask them questions about their experiences on the course and what they've done since graduating. Um, on the MA Performance, alongside the programme leaders Cheryl Gow and Merrin Owen, I'm really interested in how training in acting and musical theatre can be complemented by rigorous and critical engagements with theory. So uh, I work particularly on the Creative Project Unit, which uh, students uh, engage in a practice research project where they create a specific presentation of performance which is grounded by research and we're going to talk a bit more about that today but these creative projects can range from performance lectures and workshops to autobiographical performances and drag shows and sort of everything in between uh, students gain experience of making their own work and conducting academic research at master's level this time today we're going to be thinking about creativity, criticality and performance and I'm really excited that we are joined uh, today by Tanya Wachuku uh, and Tanya is an Igbo performer, writer, archivist and educator born and raised in London. She's a member of the Octavia Poetry Collective and a Barbican Young Poets alumni. <laughs> Uh, this is where I read out your bio, Tanya, so you have to listen while I talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> she received her MA in performance acting from Mount View, which resulted in her solo show, The Cola Nut Does Not Speak English. Tanya is also the co-founder of the Black in the Day, of sorry, of Black in the Day, the submission-based photo archive documenting the lives and experiences of Black people in the UK. She's currently a researcher for Black Digital Archiving, a research project led by multitudes investigating the state of digital archives for and about Black people in the UK. Welcome, Tanya. It's Thank you. <laughs> very lovely to have you here. It's always this like the awkward moment where we sit and you nod and smile as I talk about you. <laughs> It's all right, we've passed it now, it's, it's gone. <laughs> good, good, good. So, um, I sort of wanted to start, we start with kind of generic questions in some ways, and obviously like you graduated not long before like a pandemic world. And whilst I think it's important to acknowledge, I also think we sort of spend a lot of time talking about it. And, 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 and in many ways, I'm interested to start today, just talking about the work you've done since graduating the MA performance and how you found navigating the theatre world as an actor, performer and maker. Like, what have you been up to and how have you found it? Um, so, yeah, graduating pre-pandemic was fun. Um, <laughs> we graduated September and the pandemic hit like maybe like five or six months after that. So, you know, weird, <laughs> basically it's, it's just been weird. So um, the November after graduating, I did um, the Cola Not Does Not Speak English at Maiden Speech Festival. And then um, I was doing, and then I filmed some stuff for for um netflix when uh like in october um and then in january i was invited to do um the vault festival so i did the cola does not speak english again at the vault and um the last three shows were cancelled because of the pandemic so since then i mean i don't yeah it's been it's been tough if I'm going to be be honest, it's been tough. You you audition and then it's quiet again because obviously we have lockdown and no one knows what's happening and production companies are kind of scared to do things because they don't know, blah, 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 blah. Um, but I've been trying to use this time to, um, to, yeah, just to be creative in other ways and to really, to really be, I suppose, intentional about my practice um, and looking at the ways outside of acting that I can enrich myself as an actor and really just pay attention to what I suppose training post drama school looks like even when I'm not actually on a job um yeah does that answer your question yeah. <laughs> I think that's really interesting I like the idea of being in intentional and also there's something interesting in the fact that it doesn't finish that training doesn't finish that we kind of keep on developing and, and learning yeah maybe this is kind of a, a, a tag on but 
what are the sort of things that you've been thinking about in terms of training or, or even in terms of like developing in your own practice? Like where have you been going? Um, I've sort of kind of taken it back to the basics and like really tried to understand, I suppose, what acting is and what it means to me and what I consider to be good acting and what that looks like. Um, and I think it's not to say that drama school doesn't equip you with those skills, but I think sometimes, well, for me coming out of drama school and going straight into like self-taping and just playing all of these different people in the space of a, in, of a week, like I'd get like five tapes in a week and I'm, I'm having to, and I'm thinking about, I think I found myself thinking about what do these people want versus how do I see this character and who, who, what am I bringing to this character and I think ultimately what I've really I think what was kind of like the <laughs> the light bulb moment for me is just really the understanding of like they want to see you and I've heard that before and it didn't really settle in until honestly like maybe like five or six months ago where it's what you bring it's it's yourself and that that's what makes the character interesting versus I suppose what you think that people want to see um and yeah, so that, that was a very steep learning curve. <laughs> and so I've just been kind of picking up on that with like, you know, classes and also just creating things with friends and making my own work and um, roller skating as well, which has been quite freeing. Yeah, fun times. Um, yeah. I guess, and then I will move on, but mm -hmm. what, what do, do you think there was a particular thing or a set of things that shifted in that idea of they want to see you between knowing that and kind of understanding it? Do you, think, do you, do you know what the difference is or what felt like it made the change for you? Yeah, I think it was confidence. Definitely just confidence. Just knowing that I, everything, I, everything I need, I have. Um, so, and I can already see the difference, even just in terms of the amount of callbacks I'm getting and things like that and the feedback that I'm getting. It's just knowing that or feeling secure in the understanding that what I bring is very different to what the next person is going to bring and understanding that as long as I give, I suppose, my fullest interpretation with confidence and just give it me that what, regardless of what the outcome, outcome is, I could be happy and content with what I've done because mm -hmm. I know that that's all I can bring. I can't bring someone else to this, to the, you know, to the screen or to the stage or whatnot. Um, so yeah, it's definitely been confidence. Like I feel like I can bring my full self to the room, which I think sometimes as an actor or maybe like as, as someone who's training, you feel like you have to separate the self from the character. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's not always the case. And that's what I'm learning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really interesting. It's actually really interesting because when so we've done a couple of these conversations, we did a conversation with um, Nico and Beth, um, and they talked a lot about again bringing themselves to the room and bring and, and and actually and again that that that's a process of confidence and kind of learning that that's a value that bringing yourself into the room is a value, an additive to the project rather than a kind of a, a lack in some way. Exactly. Great. All right. I want to talk a little bit about the work that we've done a bit together, which is sort of odd because we've sort of done it in a pandemic where we've never actually been in the same room doing it, but we've talked about it quite a lot. So, <laughs> yeah. so, um, so we, um, we're, we're co-teaching the seminars for the creative project module that the MA performance uh, people undertake. So um, I talked about that a bit in the introduction, just thinking for the li listeners, for the viewers, whatever, let's let's go with that. Uh, the module asks students to create a presentation or a performance, which is kind of grounded in research. And they undertake a practice research inquiry led by their ideas, their interests, and often their identity. Often it's kind of a very much identity led for quite a lot of people not always but that's a key finder and so to, so to prep for that work we each led a series of seminars that were kind of complementary but distinct so I talked to them about autobiographical performance devising performance and then working with theory and you talked to them about solo performance culturally yeah. conscious concepts and casting right all the C's and, then, <laughs> and again working with complex theory and what and what that means and my sense is that these kind of sessions offer the chance for students to engage critically with complex ideas, but also to think about how when they're making work, their creative choices don't just appear, 
but they're connected to the personal, the cultural, the political, and those kind of commitments. And I guess I'd be really interested to hear about your experiences of working on the unit and and, and maybe what you've learned from teaching in some ways as well. Um, yeah, it's been, it's been, I don't want to say, okay, it's been fun. I was gonna say, I don't want to say fun because I feel like I've said fun already, but it has been, um, I suppose, maybe in a sense liberating, just knowing that um, that I can teach. I don't know. I don't know if that makes sense. I don't know. Because it's not that I haven't taught before, but I think, especially coming as someone who's just graduated, it almost felt like I can imagine, I, I don't know, maybe like the students being like, well, you you just got here sis so like what do you know <laughs> like you just you literally just got out so like you know what can you teach me that you know um but I think what was really um I suppose what felt really good was being able to like empower the students with the skills and knowledge that they can create their own work because I know the first session I had so that the first session I had was the solo um performance sessions and that was really just kind of about um a understanding what solo performance is understanding the various ways that solo performance can look like um because uh, I think I think a lot of people just kind of just had this idea that it was them standing in the middle of the stage and just saying words but it can look like I don't know like cabaret it could look like a magic show it could look like a, a comedy sketch it could look like so many different things and so it was really rewarding being able to see that everyone's kind of minds opened up to the possibilities of what they can then create from solo performance um and then in that same session I kind of did um an exercise where they had to create something by themselves and I gave them a very limited time I think it was like 10 minutes or something like that and that was to encourage them to I suppose let go of, of the idea of it having to be perfect because coming from that process I know how easy it is to kind of want everything to be so good that you get to a place where you don't do anything because yeah you you want to achieve greatness but you're scared of not achieving it so then you don't do anything so anyway so it was just about kind of taking away that from the process um and with the culturally conscious casting sessions I think what was really important about those sessions was understanding language and the importance of language and are we saying what we mean and doing what we say we're going to do so we were looking specifically at um like colorblind casting and things like that um and what does it mean when we say colorblind casting and what are the um what are the implications of, of that? Um, so yeah, that I think was something that when we had that session, there were a lot of things that were happening in the world that related back to the things that we were discussing. And I think people were then making the connection to the theory and to real life and to then the work that they were then thinking about making. Um, so they can then see, yeah, they can see that those two things aren't separate. Like theory is not just this, this academic thing that we have to do, but it's very much intrinsically linked to, to the self and to the world that we live in. Um, yeah, I feel like I've been talking. <laughs> that's, that's, that's why you're here. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, some of that stuff around theory and that's kind of where I, that, you know, obviously the stuff that I kind of, do all the time is kind of working with theory in the broader sense and and you know and absolutely often there is an assumption that theory describes something that isn't in the world in the same way that often people talk about university as not the real world you yeah know, like like when you get into the real world and like this is this is the what is it if it's not the real world you know and then so I think getting students to understand yes exactly that relationship between that theory is references something material and that and then what you do in the room references something material and there's this kind of relationship between theory practice and quote unquote reality that is really important and so people start to interrogate when I say these things it has these material implications exactly which then means that I have to think about what I do and what I say in rooms and I think that's really that can often be really challenging and really destabilizing. Yeah. But it's also really important. Very important. Yeah. 
and I think also just with those sessions, it was the understanding of or, or highlighting the fact that theatre is just like a microcosm of the real world. So like, what what do you want from the world? And what do you want to see in theatre? And both of them are like very, very similar. So yeah, I was just thinking about that, that it's not just, you, you don't just get on stage and make something pretty for the fun of it to, to showcase your like, the good shit that you can do Ooh, can I swear I don't know sorry yeah. um <laughs> to showcase like your your I don't know to show off but that is LinkedIn like real life stuff <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely and I'm and, uh, saying absolutely a lot as well but I think there is something fascinating about um about absolutely that you know that, that, that when we do think on stage and again Mika and Beth talk about this just on the, like being on stage is representational but those representations matter so when you're on stage you represent something and they have material implications for the real world and, and what we see in the world so when we you know and suddenly i think often not always for the first time but often in these sessions we're we're, t we're we're asking people to take fundamentally under like understood ideas or accepted ideas like identity or mm. like class or like race or like gender or like sexuality and go and and unpick exactly what they mean both in relation to performance and in relation to the, the the world around us and that can that's challenging um for sure i think and and, the, and brings up some really interesting conversations but how we then yeah. connect that through to practice is the exciting stuff i think exactly um i wondered if it would be interesting maybe then to hear you talk more about that process for you, so that process of engaging kind of intellectually or theoretically with these ideas in your own creative practice. So you talked about your own show about the the, the coming up to not speaking English, and I wondered about the how you might engage with intellectual ideas, but also practices beyond acting in your work, and yeah. and how you found that, and maybe if this is also useful, like how do you start doing that in your work? How do you start making work? What's the process? Um, okay, so there were three parts to that yeah, question. Yeah, that's sort of two questions. Um, <laughs> um, uh, theory and, I, I mean, I've always, I've always just enjoyed reading um, and enjoyed just learning stuff and, and I suppose having an idea and, or, or having something introduced to me and reading around it and, and questioning, like, do I agree with this? Do I not agree with this? Is this applicable to me? Like, how does this affect my life? Um, and I think I really enjoyed, so one of the reasons why I came to Mount View was because of the um, creative project, because I knew up until that point, I'd never created my own show. So I'd performed my own work before and things like that, but I'd never created like a full length show. And I knew that that would be a challenge and also something that I would probably want to do more of in the future, but I just, I'd just never done it. Um, and so it was really, it was it was really it was really enriching to be able to go in and connect the things that I've been reading about and thinking about to performance and put putting that on on stage. Um, as we're saying, like a lot of these, when we think about, so I, I was using a lot of like black feminist texts and, and and things like that, and these were things I was reading before um, Mount View, but it it allowed me to explore those ideas a lot more and and to to challenge also things that I didn't necessarily agree with and and um to think of a way to to put it on on stage in terms of like how I start making work it's a, it's a sticky one <laughs> it's a sticky one I think it is I think it's difficult if for me personally it's it's I don't have one process to to creating work I think sometimes it it it, it can come from like the pressure of having to like being in a space like uni or being commissioned to do something it's like oh shit I have to do something um but then also I think sometimes it literally just starts with um an obsession and I'm thinking a lot about obsession I've been thinking a lot about obsessions recently like we are obsessed with things for a reason because we find them interesting and and we want to unpick it a bit more and when I feel like I'm obsessed with something or I'm thinking about something a lot I think that then becomes the beginning of what I want to explore through work, whether that be 
thinking of writing a monologue or probably like a show or um, even just poetry or now outside of uni I've been thinking outside of Mount View, Mount View I've been thinking about um, yeah just like making like short films and other ways of of, of telling stories yeah no, mm. no, that, that makes sense and there's something about stickiness and obsessions which I think like you talk about it being sticky but I'm a bit I'm a big fan of like stickiness as a like way of thinking of how we are in the world and, and how we might be theoretically and creatively so like I'm stickiness also implies like we might stick to things and they stick to us in different ways and so I have a big question I would ask at the beginning of the creative project often is like what are you sticking to and what's right. sticking to you right because you sort of go and that can be pleasant that can be like oh that I'm keep up. but I can also be oh why oh god it's sticking to me why is it sticking to me you know yeah. that's like a really interesting kind of process of like yeah, yeah. and really i think that's why like when i was doing when we were doing like uh when we had students as tutors well, when we were tutoring students um i was asking them to free write because again I think with that same idea of stickiness, sometimes you're not even sure, you, you, you may not be conscious of the things that are stuck to you. Um, and it's through writing, um, especially writing without judgment as well, that you can then come to what those things are and then start to unpick it further. Um, yeah. Yeah, it is. It's funny, I think we all, I did some free writing with, with people as well. And it's a funny, it's like one of those tasks that you just kind of pick up and you do. And I know I use it all the time just to bypass that bit of my brain that says you don't have anything interesting to say. <laughs> because so we, and, and I think I do it loads. And of course, students do it of going, well, I don't know. I have nothing. I, I have nothing going on. And actually, but that kind of writing without judgment is a really good process of interrupting that bit. Exactly. Great. Cool. Um, I would like to just hear a little bit more about just to kind of like always nice to talk about other work to hear a bit more about the Black in the Day project. My baby. Um, yeah. Can you, tell, <laughs> can you tell us a bit more about it? I'd love to talk about it. Um. Yeah. So Black in the Day. Um. It's so it's a, it's a submission based um digital photo archive. Um, as you said, documenting the lives and experiences of Black people in the UK. I've said that like a million times since 2016. <laughs> um, so yeah, we, we started in 2016 and it really honestly just started as, it started from a conversation between me and my co-founder um, and we were just discussing like our parents' photos, like the photos that were in our family albums and essentially kind of like what happens to them, like as a lot of them are actual physical photos like and if they're not digitized or scanned and whatnot what happens to them um and initially in my mind it was just going to be like a tumblr account with just like images of, of family photos from myself him and maybe a few friends and then it just turned into this huge thing where loads of people were submitting images and then we started having um events called scanning socials because what we found was that people either didn't have access to scanners or just didn't know how to use their scanners or just couldn't be bothered um so we would bring a scanner down to it to a venue and we'd bring djs and there'll be drinks and whatnot and people would just bring their photos and we would scan them on site and that was really lovely because it allowed people to kind of come off offline and be in a, in a real life space and kind of connect in that way and have those conversations. And ultimately, it's just about kind of intergenerational conversations and understanding the links between us and the generation before and also the generations before them um, and, and how where we are now is largely due to what they were on before. Um, it's not difficult to kind of see like in mainstream British history, there's not a lot of images of like, just like everyday black people doing random everyday <laughs> things growing up in school, I didn't see it as well. So it's it's difficult to kind of feel like you have a stake in a place where you don't see yourself um, historically as well. Although when you look at history, largely Great Britain is great because of people from the global majority so um yeah I suppose it's just kind of trying to remedy that and um yeah, yeah. So it's, been great. it's been a great journey we've done exhibitions and things like that and you know we've we've shared the archive like at like the Tate the VNA and in places like that also like Afropunk New York and 
we've also done like workshops in schools and with like smaller youth groups and things so it's been a nice mix of of um engaging the archive with people from literally all over the world and all different ages yeah it's really exciting because i think you know and because archives are often well in, i guess popularly kind of assumed to be these kind of neutral sites of of like history and they're just not they they, they have huge gaps and, and particularly they have gaps for black and global majority kind of voices and, and bodies and identities but like marginalized subjects don't make it into the on, into the histories and 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 that therefore finding kind of grassroots if that's the right term kind of grassroots ways of, st of starting these archives is really important because because it start as you say it starts to reflect lives the lives of people who are implicated in nations or implicated in communities and i think you know that that's really when we talk about the personal being political mm. and constantly in, in creative project sessions that's what we're getting at is that you make a personal moment of oh it'd be really great to have a digital archive of my family yeah. and that becomes this kind of this, this kind of intergenerational project that feels like properly political and joy joy joyful as well i guess is the, and so. i think that's that's the thing as well because joy i think is so central to the archive because again the pictures that people have just taken at home and, and and whatnot and people's own personal documentation so it's not voyeuristic it's not like a documentary photographer going into a community and like taking pictures of like churches and stuff like that it's just people taking everyday people taking pictures of what is important to them and largely it's really joyful moments so yeah when you look through your archive it's just full of so much joy and it's so beautiful to kind of look through and see mm -hmm. um so yeah it's important for for those reasons and many others but i think that is like this really underlying thing it's just the joys yeah, yeah. And that again, and I guess yeah, it's really nice that you see that joy in the archive. But those those um, socials you talk about feel sound like really joyful, kind of like coming together, being together. It's a shakedown. We get down. <laughs> like, we, we really get down. They're really lovely, and like also like people find like family members and stuff. Like it's yeah, it's been it's been crazy. <laughs> Do you think, uh, uh, like, do these got this kind of archival practice? I guess does it connect to your theatre work? Do you see a kind of link between them, or a future link between them? Um, yeah, I think for me, it. it so the colon does not speak English was about, um, I suppose, documenting. So the question that I was exploring was how to um, document uh, family histories using uh, African theatre practices. And so I'm always thinking about the people who came before us. I'm always thinking about preservation and documentation. Like, and so throughout everything I'm doing, that, that comes through. So I didn't come into Mount View thinking I was going to do a show about that and the colon up being what it was. But again, with stickiness and, and um, the th our obsessions, like it just came through. And I think, yeah, I'm, I'm just always interested in, in genealogy and ethn ethno ethnography and all of these different things that just tie us individual as individuals to like a wider thing like this wider network of of people who came before us and made decisions and you know that ultimately led us to where we are today um so i think anything i make going forward will always be attached to generations thinking generationally and also just like like my family and 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 what that means and things like that um yeah 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 it's fascinating and I, i'm really fascinated in those kind of lineages that are all, all those generations or those histories that aren't just like in my own work i think about horizontal kind of connections as much as vertical ones that that, that, mm -hmm. that we kind of exist within these networks that that branch out forwards and backwards and sideways in kind of really complex ways because often also often non-legitimate histories don't function in such a simple way but you might kind of skip sideways in order to understand what goes forwards and that sort of stuff as well is really yeah nice, nice. horizontally nice. yes yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to think about the ways in which i might have a connection for example to like um, anyway, and we'll move on, but like someone like Miss Kimberley is like a black trans cabaret performer uh, mm. and that we kind of have, we have a kind of familial connection, despite mm. the fact that 
she grew up in the US and in, you know, and, 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 and has a kind of whole, but yet there is something about our kind of queer lived experience that connects us and in a way that is fascinating, um, yeah. but, but not without its problems as well, right? And there's something really fascinating in the ways in which we might intersect in context with this, for sure. Yeah. Mm. I love that. Mm. <laughs> so I guess we, we should start rounding up because we've been going for a little bit, but um, I want to just <laughs> amazing how quickly the time goes. I guess I've got kind of two rounding questions, one looking backwards and one looking forwards. And I think the, okay. the kind of first one looking backwards is if you could send a message to yourself just before you started the MA at Mount View, mm -hmm. what do you think you would say to yourself? What would I say to myself? I think I would say to myself to be, I don't know, be a bit more free. Because I think um, if Meryl and Cheryl watch this, they might laugh, but I, I used to get a lot of feedback about, and my feedback was always be more forward footed or something like that, or just speak a lot more and I think I I'm a person who likes to sit down and listen and and I'm really like cognitive and 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 also like really emotive but like I just I like to listen to people so when I'm in spaces with a lot of people I tend to just listen and I think what tends to happen is that I, I suppose people t assume that it's I, I don't know I don't know but anyways um I would tell myself to be a bit more free um and I say a bit more because I do feel like when I look back at my experience from Mount View I don't regret anything so I think that's why it's a bit difficult to answer that question because I feel like I I feel like I'd mentally prepared myself for going into that space before going into that space and even when things weren't great or when things were ex excellent or whatnot I, I I was prepared for it um so yeah but I would say to be a bit more free yeah. yeah yeah that makes sense that's interesting it's yeah. kind of interesting because i think that's a similar thing in maybe different words that um miko and beth said i think they said sit they reflected in similar ways the sense mm. of kind of like be in the room trust yourself like that <laughs> so I was yeah um, was, i always sorry to you got i always feel like um if i'd gone into drama school when i was 18 i would have had a very different experience mm -hmm. because i didn't know myself as much or I wasn't as confident and I think that makes a lot of difference mm -hmm. so again I think that's why my answer is my answer because I, I went at, I was 27 when I started 27 26 27 um and I'd been through life and I'd done you know done shit and done stuff sorry um <laughs> and I'd done stuff and and um yeah I went in there with a with a bit more of a grounding which also allowed me to be a bit more free so yeah, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think kind of interesting because that kind of comes all the way back to that that sense of confidence that you're talking about at the beginning and being able to just, you know, and owning that what you bring into the room is what is needed in the room kind of thing. Which is kind of exactly. Nice. All right. Last thing then, and I guess it's kind of looking forward and thinking about, you know, it feels kind of remiss not to sort of think about that over the last 12 months, one of the kind of biggest events is the, like, huge if long overdue emphasis on the ways in which black and global majority lives are included like and i'm thinking here within theater specifically mm. um with all the complex ideas of what inclusion means or what being included means and i just think with all of this and with kind of where what, what's happened over the last 12 18 months what do you think the future or what do you hope the future of theater or the arts is in general where do you think we're going or where do you want us to go um So, as you mentioned earlier, I'm doing some research work with archives and a, a lot of what we've been doing recently is speaking with like local archives about um, the, the types of black, black collections that they have within the archives and whether those things have been digitized and what the problems are and yada, 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 et cetera, et cetera. And one thing that I came away thinking yesterday, in fact, in fact was that a lot of people know what to do, but they're afraid. And I think they're also afraid of 
not being the person. So I think people, and so I, and I say that because I think the same thing applies to theater is that people know what the problems are. Um, there have been many panels, many discussions, many blah, 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 blah about it. We know what the problem is, but I think there's some fear of letting go of the reins because those same people are just not the people who can do what needs to be done. And that is probably for many different reasons, things like a, a, a steep learning curve, like there needs to be a lot of learning that, you, that needs to happen in order for certain decisions to be made and changes to be made and things like that. And you just might not be the person. And I think that people just need to really think about what the outcome should be and how we get there and to be brave enough to make those decisions. And I think there's just a lack of bravery. Yeah. So I would say I want people to be more brave and to just do what they need to do. Because we know what it is. <laughs>